This faith and finance podcast is underwritten in part by Eventide Investments. They believe that investing is more than just returns. It's an opportunity to partner with companies that align with your values and are making a positive difference in the world. Learn more at eventideinvestments.com. Jesus told his disciples not to boast about their giving, but does that mean all our giving should be done in secret? Hi, I'm Rob West. Put another way, are there times when talking about our giving is actually a good thing? John Reinhardt joins us today to talk about this intriguing topic, and then it's on to your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. Okay, our guest today is my good friend, John Reinhardt. He's founder of Gospel Patrons, an organization with a unique mission for spreading the gospel around the world. John, it is a delight to have you on the program. Thanks, Rob. This is a thrill for me, too. (laughs) John, before we dive into our topic today, I'd love for you just to educate our listeners on Gospel Patrons. What is it and how is God moving? Yeah, well, Gospel Patrons was first the title of a book that I wrote, and then it mushroomed into a ministry after that because there was so much traction around this idea that behind every great movement of God, God is going to raise up someone to proclaim the gospel. He's going to raise up that preacher, that missionary, that person that we think of on the front lines of you know, spreading the word of God to the ends of the earth. But he's also going to raise up those who stand alongside them. And their gift is not maybe preaching or crossing a culture and learning a language, but their gift is to stand alongside them through generosity and partnership and prayer and support. And so that's what a gospel patron is. And we've seen thousands of leaders around the world, specifically business leaders and professional people, resonate with this idea that they're not second class Christians, but they too have a part to play in what God's doing in this generation. Mm, It's a powerful message, John. I love how you say there's gospel proclaimers and there's gospel patrons helping to underwrite support and fund that work. And this applies to Billy Graham. It also applies to Jesus, doesn't it? Don't we see this in the Bible? Yeah, that's the amazing thing. (laughs) That blew my mind. In Luke chapter 8, we read the story of three women who funded Jesus's ministry. And God could have funded Jesus's ministry through fishes and loaves or the best winery in the Roman Empire made out of tap water. I mean, he could have done it any way he wanted. But the way he chose was three women who stepped forward and gave of their own resources to fund Jesus's three years of preaching, teaching, healing, and the disciples traveling with him. So it's just Uh, extraordinary. Yeah, it's powerful. And you can learn a lot more at gospelpatrons.org or pick up the book. All right, John, let's dive into our topic. If you ask 100 Christians, should all your giving be in secret? Maybe 99 of them would say, well, yes, because of what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 2, through four, but you think we've been reading too much into that passage. So I'd love for you to explain that. Yeah, the context is Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. And so it's three chapters, Matthew five, six, and seven. And what's amazing to me about that is in that whole section when Jesus says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is giving. He also talks about we should pray in secret and we should fast in secret. Well, I know churches that do corporate fasts. I know churches that do corporate digital media fasts. I know churches that pray in public and people have prayer meetings where they actually pray out loud. And so I think what we understand from the context is Jesus wasn't saying we should never share about our giving. We should never share about our praying and praying in public. We should never not talk about our fasting. Like, I think there's a lot of uh, situational realities here that Jesus was really focused on our motivation. Are we talking about it in order to be seen and glorified by others? Or is there a chance that we could talk about it in a way that's really helpful and building up? So that's the first thing we see from the context. The second is in the very same sermon, Jesus says to his disciples, let your light shine before men. Mm. Wait, 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 wait a minute. (laughs) I thought you said to be seen, we should be in secret for all these things. But he says, wait, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. And so there is a time to not have your light under a basket, but to let it shine before others, not so that we get glorified, but so that they see our good works and glorify him. And to me, this was revolutionary to see. That's in the same sermon. This isn't, I'm not pulling some random verse from somewhere else. This is in the very same message. And so 
certainly giving is a good work. When we think about Jesus saying, so they see your good works, man, generosity and giving and contributing to the needs of people, suffering people, hurting people, ministries, pastors, leaders, missionaries, that's a good work. And there are times to let that light shine. Third, Jesus publicly highlighted generous people. And uh, that's the crazy thing is Jesus celebrated generous people. So he didn't always keep it a secret himself. Uh, That's incredible. Well, when we come back from this break, we'll talk about a few of those generous givers named in the Bible. We'll also talk about perhaps when your giving should be anonymous and what's the right motivation for our giving. That and much more with our friend John Reinhardt, founder of Gospel Patrons, when we return from this break. Stay with us. As a faithful listener of this program, you know that there's life-changing financial wisdom in God's Word. And FaithFi is here to help you and millions of others learn to be good and faithful stewards. As a nonprofit organization, we rely on help from monthly FaithFi patrons, supporters of this mission, to help us continue and expand our outreach. Has God provided financial answers for you through this ministry? If so, consider becoming a monthly FaithFi patron. Visit faithfi.com and click Give. We're grateful for support from Guidestone, whose diversified suite of investment solutions align with Christian values to create positive change in the world. More information is available at GuidestoneFunds.com. Investing involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Carefully consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of Guidestone Funds before investing. They're distributed by Foresight Funds Distributors, LLC, which is not an advisory affiliate, a registered investment advisor, nor do they provide investment advice. Have you thought about the fact that there are gospel proclaimers and gospel patrons called to fund and support the work of the proclaimers? That's what we're talking about today with John Reinhardt, founder of Gospel Patrons. And specifically, should your giving be done in secret? John's challenging that idea with Jesus' own words from the Sermon on the Mount to perhaps broaden our vision for our giving and the opportunity to spur others on in our giving. And John, just before the break, you were sharing that uh, many of the generous people in the Bible are named. So God wanted us to know about them. You mentioned a few before the break, specifically Mary, Joanna, and Susanna, who were providing for Jesus' ministry. But who are a few of the other generous givers in Scripture? Yeah, do you remember the story of Zacchaeus? Uh, we learned it as little children, as Zacchaeus, the wee little man. Right, of course. <laughs> this tax collector. He climbed that he, tree. That's right. <laughs> well, he comes to Jesus. Jesus has lunch at his house, and this man changes, and it says that he repaid those who he had uh, overcharged four times and gave, gave his money to the poor. Wow. He's named for his generosity. And uh, in addition to that, we see in the New Testament that Paul had a gospel patron. Paul had this wealthy woman who funded him him and perhaps even carried the the letter that Paul had written to the church in Rome, to the people of Rome, to the believers in Rome for the first time. And Paul acknowledges her saying, she's been a patron of many and Mm. of myself as well. Perhaps the most famous in the New Testament is Barnabas because, man, this guy was just setting the bar for generosity in the early church by selling his field and donating it to the needs of the apostles and the growing church movement in Jerusalem. And that wasn't hidden. He was named. Actually, if you, if we look at it closely in the book of Acts, his name wasn't Barnabas. It was Joseph. But the mm-hmm. apostles nicknamed him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, because pastors, missionaries, if someone sells their property and gives you the proceeds so that you can advance the gospel through your ministry, give that guy a nickname and encouragement <laughs> and Barnabas would be yes. at the top of the list. So there's lots of giving that's mentioned specifically amounts by name in the Bible. I don't think what Jesus was saying was a prohibition for us to always keep our giving anonymous or in secret, but instead uh, to try to guard our hearts. Yeah, and clearly the Bible wouldn't have named these folks if uh, that nullified in some way their heavenly reward for uh, for the generosity itself. All right, John, uh, you mentioned a few of the reasons why it's important to actually be intentional to talk about our giving before the break. What are a couple of others? Well, I'll say one thing, and that, and that is we never grow about anything that we don't talk about. Mm. So say, let me say that positively. If we want to grow in any way, we have to start talking about it. 
If you want to get in shape, you're going to hire a trainer. You're going to get a workout partner. You're yeah. going to have a team of people around you. You're going to you know, talk to people about your diet, your exercise, and you're going to grow. If you want to get healthier, you're going to talk to your doctor and see what needs to be done. If you want yeah. to learn to play the violin, you're going to join a group of people. And you're going to have a coach and a teacher and people you're going to be talking about the violin with so that you can grow. I think one of the reasons that Christians have been stunted in our understanding of generosity from a biblical perspective is we haven't been willing to talk about it and we can't mm. grow unless we talk about it. And so this is an area that's so close to the heart of God. Generosity, I believe, is the heart of God for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever yes. believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And so at the very center of what the Bible is all about is a God who gives. Mm. And the very center of who Jesus was and what he's about is he gave his life for us. And so generosity is right at the heart of God. And if we want to grow to become like the God of the Bible, to be changed into his image, this is something we must be talking about. Secondly, I will say generosity is a spiritual gift that God gives. In the mm. list of spiritual gifts in Romans 12, we see that generosity or contributing is something that God uniquely gives to some people to really lead the way within the body of Christ. Now, we should all be generous and we can all be generous. Yes. This is not an obligation. It's a great opportunity to engage with God. But it, there's some people who really do have the gift. And just as we would have a, someone who's got the gift of teaching and want to help them and highlight them so that we can all learn from them, the gift of mercy and we want to elevate that gift so we can understand how, how we can all show mercy. So it is with generosity that we should honor that gift that God gives and celebrate it and talk about it more freely so that we can all grow in that way. Oh, that's powerful. Uh, John, for our listeners, perhaps an example might help. Uh, share an example of when it might be not only proper, but even helpful to talk about our giving. Yeah, I think um, when when you're sitting down one on one with someone, I mean, most of us didn't have parents that talked to us about generosity. Most yeah. of us didn't grow up in families where this was just a normal part of the conversation. A lot of families just don't even talk about money at all, and that's why you and I both have jobs, Rob. But <laughs> <laughs> when it's when when you're walking with someone and trying to help them think through. How does our faith apply to every area of our life? Money yeah. has to be part of the equation. Jesus talked about money, possessions, and stewardship about 25% of the time. And so it's not a topic we should ignore. It's not a topic that's separate from our faith. It's definitely integrated. And so as we walk with people, I think it's just a natural part of the discipleship conversation to say, where are you at with your giving? How? Here's some of my stories. Here's how I've seen God provide for me when I've stepped out in faith to give. And I think it's very natural, even in some of those situations, to use real numbers to help people get a real picture for what that can look like. Just as we would hope that someone who's gifted in evangelism would share their stories of how they shared their faith with someone and we can learn from that and model after that, so it is with giving. I think another wow. example of, of, why, of how it's good to share about giving is whenever there's a, a significant need. And so um, let's say that your church is building a new building and there's a building program or a campaign going on to raise money or there's a, yeah. a ministry in need. I think it's appropriate for the leaders to say, Guys, we want we want you to join us in this, uh, and we're a part of this too. We're in on what this is doing, and, and we see that in, interestingly in Nehemiah and in David's life. Both of them mm -hmm. raised money for different things. Nehemiah for rebuilding the walls, David for the temple, and they both shared specifics on their own giving as a way to inspire others to join them and do the same. And so, wow. I think there's a there's a burden on leaders at times, or an opportunity for them not to kind of hide behind the anonymity of their giving, but to say, I'm all in, join me as well. Oh, that's so helpful. John, about just a minute and a half left. For somebody who's listening today and say, okay, John, I'm convinced this needs to be a part of my giving. I want to be more vocal about it, but I also want to check my heart along the way. What's a barometer to do that? Yeah, really good question. Uh, I, I think that we need to ask, what is my heart's motivation? And our hearts are tricky things and they do all kinds of, have all kinds of different motivations. But yeah. I think the first question to ask is, could I give joyfully in this situation, even if nobody but God ever knew about it? Mm, if yeah. my name doesn't get re recognized or it's not put on a building or I'm not clapped for or celebrated or told I'm generous, would I, could I joyfully do this? knowing that it's for God's honor and his glory. That's the first place you would start. First Corinthians 13 talks about, even if I gave my body away, <laughs> but mm. did not have love, yeah. I'm, it's, not, it, it's nothing. It doesn't matter to God. And so 
we really want to check our hearts for love. Like, do I have joy in this? And do I have love for the people I'm giving it to or the cause that God has put on my heart? And begin to evaluate your motives. And I think sometimes we do need to give anonymously and just say, God, that one's just for you. Mm, yeah. <laughs> if nobody ever knows about it, that one's just for you. And there are times then to let your light shine and talk about it freely and joyfully, not to, not to seek praise from men, but to inspire others, to disciple others, and to continue to grow. Oh, wow. You've expanded our vision today, perhaps on a verse we've read hundreds of times, but you've given us some additional things to think about. And I know that'll draw us into a more intimate relationship with the Father. That's our goal, at least today. John, thanks for stopping by, my friend. Absolutely. That's John Reinhardt with Gospel Patrons. You can learn more at gospelpatrons.org. Check it out today or pick up the book, gospelpatrons.org. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We are grateful for support from Sound Mind Investing in the Faith and Finance Program. For more than 30 years, they've been helping Christians reach their financial goals with step-by-step -step guidance for investors at every stage, from those just getting started to those getting ready for retirement. Through scriptural principles and practical suggestions, SMI offers financial wisdom for living well. More information, including the short video webinar on profit and peace of mind, no matter what's happening in the market, is available at soundmindinvesting.org. Are you struggling to fit your faith into your practice as a Christian financial advisor? The Certified Kingdom Advisor designation teaches you a step-by-step -step process to confidently deliver advice that aligns with Christian values. Discover the skills you need to help your clients make a kingdom impact. Get started today by enrolling in the CKA educational program at kingdomadvisors.com slash get certified. That's kingdomadvisors.com slash get certified. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West, and it's time to take your calls and questions now on anything financial. 800-525-7000 is the number to call. We've got some lines open. You know, my experience in doing this for decades is that uh, our financial journey is one of the key ways God shapes our spiritual journey. That's right. The way we handle money is a tangible expression of what we value, where we've placed our trust. It's evident whether we're fixed on the hope of the eternal or the temporal. And if we're not careful, money can attempt to dethrone God from first position in our lives, making money the object of our affection as opposed to handling money in such a way that it's true that God is really at the center and that he is where uh, ultimately our hope and our trust is. And as we work out those daily financial decisions, well, it allows us to grow up in our faith. The key is that we look to a biblical worldview of money management and all we do, but certainly that includes this area of money management because we're stewards, managers of the King of Kings resources. Well, on this program, we want to help you do that faithfully, looking, of course, to the counsel of Scripture as our guide. So with whatever you're thinking about today financially, debt repayment, maybe it's your giving strategy or living within your means, maybe your long-term savings, whatever it might be, give us a call. Let's talk about it. 800 525 7000 is the number to call. Uh, let's begin today with Merrill. Uh, go right ahead. How can I help? Hey, Bob. Uh, hopefully this is a simple question. I have a... Uh, a uh, 401k IRA uh, in a mutual fund, and I have a 403b that I uh, uh, contributed to when I was working for a school district here in Florida. Yeah. And the uh, 403b does not allow me to make it the the, the uh, RMD a QCD. Right. So I'd like to know if I can move that 403b out of the 403b and just into the standard IRA. Uh, without any kind of penalties or worry about tax problems, and then be able to give that all that money uh, in, in a QCD. 
Yeah. And the short answer is absolutely, Merrill. You can definitely do that. So just for the benefit of our listening audience, uh, Merrill's throwing out some terms here that I'd love to define for you just to make sure you're on the same page with us. That is, he's got a company-sponsored plan. A 403B version is the nonprofit uh, version of that. He worked for a school district. They allowed him to contribute to a retirement plan. Once you separate from the company, uh, or in this case, the school, then you can move that uh, 403B or 401K, roll it out to an IRA, a, a traditional IRA. That's not a taxable event because it stays inside a qualified plan or account, um, which is a tax deferred vehicle. Once you do that, then the QCD that he's talking about, qualified charitable distribution, uh, Merle, that's absolutely then in play because you can make a QCD out of an IRA directly to a nonprofit ministry, charity, your church, any 501c3, that's not going to be added to your taxable income. So you wouldn't pay tax on it as you would if you take a standard distribution from an IRA. But the benefit is the ministry or your church gets the full benefit of the amount that you transfer, uh, and it counts toward your required minimum distribution, which, as you well know, once you reach, it's now 73, it's going up to 75 eventually. Once you reach that age, the government's going to make you take a certain amount out based on your balance and your life expectancy each year. And you can satisfy that amount through this qualified charitable distribution. So I think uh, the next step for you is to just roll that out to your existing IRA, and you would just contact your plan administrator to get that rollover paperwork. And on that paperwork, you would tell them who your custodian is and what the title of the account is and the account number, and they'll just transfer the assets over. Perfect. Well, listen, thank you so much, Rob. I appreciate everything you do. It's a great ministry you're for, for, uh, providing for us. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you, and we appreciate you being on the program today. And I love that you're thinking about giving not only generously, but giving wisely, Merrill. That's uh, that's a great uh, thing for us all to be thinking about. Thanks for your call today. Uh, Jeffrey is in Boynton Beach, Florida. Go ahead, sir. Hi, Rob. God bless you for your ministry. Thank you. It's uh, such a help. I listen to it almost every day. Oh, great. My question is, uh, my question is, I'm getting a settlement from an accident I was in actually four years ago, finally mm -hmm. settled, oh, uh, and it's about $11,000. Yeah. I have $8,000 in credit card debt, and I'm wondering if you thought it might behoove me to pay the credit card debt off or take some of that money and put it in an emergency fund because I don't really have one yet, and then maybe just do some of the credit card, or uh, what do you think a good approach would be for me? Yeah. Well, the short answer is, but I'm going to give you a little caveat here in a second. The short answer is, yes, I would pay off the credit card debt. Here's why. Typically, when somebody has high interest credit card debt, which is what you've got, we would say, let's have, and this, this is not a magic number, it's just kind of a rule of thumb. Let's build that emergency fund, not up to three to six months expenses where we ultimately want it, but let's put $1,500 away just so we've got something to fall back on to break the cycle of the charging. And then let's, with every extra available dollar, let's attack that credit card debt until it's paid off. You can do better than that here. If you're getting 11000 back uh, or a, as a part of this settlement, you can wipe out your credit card debt, and now you've got 3000 to plow into your emergency fund, and that's exactly what I do. I wouldn't spend it. Put it in your emergency fund so it's there for the unexpected. But here's the thing. Um, you've got to make sure before you do this that you've eliminated the reason that got you into the credit card debt in the first place. Because the last thing I'd want you to do is wipe out that credit card debt, stick 3000 in your emergency fund, and continue overspending beyond your lifestyle. And then you call me back in six months and say, well, Rob, the credit card debt's gone, but guess what? Now it's back. And Maybe it's a little higher than it was before. So I want you to demonstrate to yourself for at least 60 days that you can live on a balanced budget and that you can live within your means. And if you can, then absolutely, let's pay off the credit card debt. Let's put 3000 in emergency savings. And then let's take what you were sending to the credit cards and continue to build your emergency fund until you get to three to six months expenses. Does that make sense? Will there... 
Will there be a lot of tax involved in that? Shouldn't be any tax whatsoever, because that's a settlement making you whole for a loss that you had. We appreciate your call, Jeffrey. God bless you, my friend. I hope you're doing better and uh, not having any in lingering issues from that accident. Hey, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to let you know that you don't ever have to miss a program. Just download our FaithFi app for your mobile device and take us with you anywhere. Thanks for joining us today. I look forward to talking with you again next time on Faith and Finance. Faith and Finance is provided by FaithFi and listeners like you.